All right, thank you so much for the introduction and thanks to Nimbus for having me here. I'm looking forward to spending the next couple of years here. Um, as, as you can probably tell from the picture here, I'm a community ecologist. And so as a community ecologist, I'm really interested in biodiversity, um, both in the factors that maintain biodiversity and the factors that threaten it. And so this just gives you a snapshot of the diversity of flowering plants you might see in my study system in eastern deciduous forests just in one week in April of any particular year. And this diversity is, is under threat by a lot of anthropogenic factors, but one of the ones that I'm interested in is invasive species. And so in, in my system where I studied um, forests in Indiana and in southern Connecticut, we see a lot of invaders like um, garlic mustard, pictured here, bush honeysuckle, purple winter creeper. And we're concerned with these species because we think that they may suppress native biodiversity by outcompeting the native plants that we, we like to see in our forests. And as a plant ecologist, when I go about studying invasion, I tend to start off by thinking about one trophic level, right? So I think about the invader that I'm interested in and the native plants that it's interacting with and whether it's going to dominate through resource competition, through mechanisms like allelopathy, which is basically chemical warfare where it releases toxins into the soil. And I focus here on just one trophic level. And if I broaden that view and take a step back, I'll often think about two trophic levels, right? So I might think about the way both of these plant species interact with herbivores, or if I'm taking a below ground perspective, think about how they're interacting with soil pathogens or soil mutualists. And this focus on studying invasion within one or two trophic levels has resulted in a few dominant invasion hypotheses, which have been somewhat successful in explaining why species become invasive. And one of those is the enemy escape hypothesis. And the enemy escape hypothesis purports that invaders are successful because they escape the damage that native species suffer from natural enemies. So if we have a natural enemy like the herbivorous insect and it's consuming the native species preferentially because they have a shared evolutionary history but avoiding the invader, then the invader gains an indirect benefit and tends to rise to a higher density. And this is one of the, the stronger hypotheses within the field of invasion ecology that's been pretty well supported by the literature. But lately it's started to be called into question a bit more as we've seen some large scale uh, literature syntheses, large scale field experiments that have found relatively mixed support for this hypothesis. And so in, in an effort to explain why this hypothesis often actually fails, I think it makes sense to take a step back and think about the food web in a broader context. So most food webs are a lot more complicated than just two plants and an herbivore, like I've shown here in this really simplified version. It's important to at least take into account, you know, maybe one more trophic level and think about how predators are interacting with the system, because any herbivores behind enemy escape are also going to have predators that are consuming them. So I decided to explore this interaction in my favorite study system. Um, this is garlic mustard, Aliaria pediolata, which may not be as common around here, but it's a very common invader in deciduous forests in Indiana, where I did my PhD, as well as in southern Connecticut, where most of the work presented here was done. And a few things to know about this species. It was introduced from Eurasia. It's a biennial, so it undergoes its first year of life as a rosette that stays green throughout the winter, and then in early spring of its second year, bolts up in flowers. And it's also, as its name implies, a member of the mustard family, um, which makes it a close relative of things that we eat, like broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, um, all of those things that don't really taste that great. And the reason they don't really taste that great is because they produce compounds called glucosinolates. And sinigrin is one of the primary glucosinolates that garlic mustard produces. And sinigrin makes it unpalatable. That's why we don't like to eat our vegetables. Um, and it can also make it allelopathic. So I mentioned allelopathy before in terms of essentially chemical warfare when plants release compounds into the soil that are harmful to other species. Um, it can have a negative impact. And so we see an allelopathic effect of garlic mustard on native species, generally mediated by the fungal community, but it can also have a direct phytotoxic effect. And we also see that unpalatability give it um, an enemy escape interaction here where native herbivores may preferentially consume native species and, and avoid garlic mustard because it tastes bad. So if we're looking at these two trophic levels, then we really expect garlic mustard to be a highly dominant species, right? It's, you know, it's going to be hammering natives both through this allelopathy or through competition and potentially through this enemy escape interaction. 
But as I said, maybe we need to take a step back and think about the food web a little bit more broadly. So I, I stumbled into this area of research because as a graduate student, I was really interested in allelopathy, and I wanted to characterize variation in allelochemical production across the entire state of Indiana. So I drove all over the state, found every garlic mustard population I could, and collected seed from it. And when you go about collecting garlic mustard seed, you find a structure that looks like this. So we have a dried up stem here that's senesced, and off of it, there are a bunch of fruit structures called siliques. And I, I emphasize the, the name of this fruit structure because it's going to come up a lot throughout this talk. So these siliques are this kind of dried dehiscent structure that sort of whirls around and branches off in this three-dimensional way. And when you go to collect garlic mustard, you find a dried up stem full of siliques, you put it into a bucket, you shake the stem against the bucket, and a bunch of seed falls out. But what I noticed was whenever I went to a site to collect seed, I got a lot of tiny web-building spiders in my buckets. Um, this became a problem because I would have to stop and pick all the spiders out of my bucket every time I collected seed. Some of them I would miss, they would crawl out on my desk and really irritate my office mates. So it became this really, really striking pattern. And when I looked at garlic mustard in the sunlight, when the light was hitting it just the right way, I realized that web building spiders really like to build their webs on these silique structures. So one thing I want to point out is that garlic mustard in supporting spiders this way is fairly structurally distinct from the native community. So these um, structures are drying up, serving as spider web substrate in late June, early July, where I've studied them, which is a time when the native community, for the most part, is pretty green and leafy, soft, not a great sturdy structure for building spider webs. So you get really dense stands of these siliques that are sort of uniquely suited as spider habitat. So <clears throat> I started to think about what this would mean from a community ecology perspective, right? It has to mean something that you're getting a lot of spiders wherever you're getting a lot of garlic mustard. So I imagine that if we have high densities of spiders, this could potentially have a negative impact on aerial insects, right? The spiders are trapping these insects in their webs and consuming them. And we know that a lot of the prey of these spiders are things like aphids, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, um, a lot of herbivorous species that might have a negative impact on the native plant community. So if spiders are consuming the herbivores of native plants, they may be having an indirect positive effect on the native community. Since these natives are competing with garlic mustard, we can follow this through and see that the spiders may actually be having an indirect negative effect on garlic mustard. So if this plays out the way I thought it might, garlic mustard might actually just be really shooting itself in the foot by supporting a, um, an arthropod community that attacks the enemy of its enemy, essentially. And we can take this out even another step further and broaden it to an ecosystem perspective and imagine that these spiders at really high densities could even be having an impact on nutrient availability, either by altering the composition of the plant community in a way that changes nutrient availability or through direct carcass de deposition onto the ground. So a lot of people think this sounds like a bit of a stretch, but I would challenge you to leave a cobweb in a corner of your house for a few days, see how many carcasses accumulate under it really quickly. It can have an impact. So I wanted to go, these were just you know ideas that I had about what, how this might play out, and I wanted to go about testing it. So I took a three-pronged approach here, starting off with a model to formalize the hypotheses about what could happen in this system and then did some field experiments to directly test these hypotheses, and then broadening the perspective even more, did a literature synthesis to kind of broaden this out to a global view of how invaders are interacting with food webs. So I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the theory. Um, what I did is I set up a model that essentially summarized this exact food web shown here. So there was an invasive plant representing garlic mustard, generalized native vegetation, and a generalized native herbivore, and a spider that consumed it, where this herbivore had a strong preference for the native species over garlic mustard. And so I'll go ahead and show you the, uh, the basic equations behind this model. Don't worry, I'm only going to spend two slides really quickly on equations. It, it won't get too bad, I promise. Um, so to just summarize... <laughs> okay, well, we can delve in further, maybe in the Q&A. <laughs> so, um, so basically, the, uh, the, the plant population growth was probably stuff that a lot of people have seen in the literature before. I had two plant species that were um, growing with negative density dependence, so essentially following a logistic growth type pattern. They were competing, lack of Volterra-style competition dynamics with one another, and they were being consumed by an herbivore with a linear functional response. Um, so really nothing new here compared to what models have been 
how bottles have been set up for years. The herbivore, in turn, was growing according to how much of the plant it was consuming, and it was experiencing losses due to predation by these spiders, as well as just background mortality from extrinsic factors. So all of this is really nothing new, but what I did is I added a little bit of a twist to the predator equation. So the predator, the spider in this case, was growing according to the amount, the, the biomass of herbivores that it was consuming, and was also experiencing some background mortality. But I introduced this term that I, I refer to as a habitat limitation term. And what this does is it specifically links the maximum number of predators that can be sustained in a system to the habitat available, so beyond food resources to actually physical structures. And to break this down just a little bit, um, I introduced a parameter that I'll refer to here as WI. And W is essentially s telling you how good something is at supporting spiders, right? So is it a good website or is it a poor website from a spider's perspective? And the invader, being a really you know, strong substrate for, for web building spiders, has a high WI. We can multiply, we can take the product of WI and the density of the invader to get an estimate of the number of websites available. And if we um, sum this together for the spiders that can be supported on both the invasive and the native vegetation, we get the maximum possible predator density. And this functions in the structure of this equation essentially like a carrying capacity, right? So we can think of a carrying capacity for the predator that's defined by the population, by the relative abundance of different plant species in the population. So Jumping right into the results on this, um, what I'll present is actually just the relative densities of both the native and the invasive plant um, in a sort of modular buildup of this, this model. So I have the native plant density here on the X, just as a percentage of carrying capacity, and the invasive plant density on the Y. And first, I just ran the model with the plants by themselves. So typical logistic growth model, they went up to their carrying capacity and stayed there. Um, so they were both at 100%. If I put the two plants together so that they were competing against one another, they both drew each other's density down to some extent. Uh, in this particular case, they were equal competitors. Some native plants are strong competitors against garlic mustard, some are weak, so I went with equal as kind of a general scenario here. Um, so they're on a level playing field with both of their densities reduced by competition. If we introduce the herbivore in the model, we see classic enemy escape where the herbivore draws down the density of the native plant and the invader is released from competition, right? So we see a case where the invader is at 90% of its carrying capacity, but the native is down to 20%. But when we introduce the predator into this system, it essentially is going to erase the effect of enemy escape, right? So we see dynamics return back to kind of this competition equilibrium where the, the native is no longer being strongly suppressed by the herbivore and the native and the invader are on this level playing field once again. So I wanted to go about testing these predictions in the field. Um, had some pretty clear predictions at this point that, that this predator plant interaction could potentially undermine enemy escape. So I set up a field experiment to look at this interaction in southern Connecticut. And the experiment was set up across natural garlic mustard invasions at six different sites where I imposed three treatments. So the first treatment I'll refer to as S+, plus, or the treatment where the siliques were intact. In this treatment, I had areas that were heavily invaded by garlic mustard. I allowed the siliques to grow up, mature, be colonized by spiders, um, and allowed those interactions to play out. In the second treatment, which I'll refer to as S-, minus, I removed the siliques. So what I did was I actually allowed the siliques to grow up and fully mature so that the um, the tissue was completely senesced. I wasn't in interfering with the physiology of the plant by clipping it out. And I went in and just clipped the siliques after they were totally dried out. And so this took away the opportunity for the spiders to actually colonize these siliques, but still left you know, the course of the invasion intact. And last of all, I had native controls, which were just nearby areas that were dominated by native species. And I set this up as meter squared plots with a half meter buffer zone around the plots where I imposed the treatment but took measurements within the central meter. So I wanted to take a few key measurements just to get, get at key aspects of the food web here. So of course, I measured spider abundance in all of these plots. And I expected that with the spider silique interaction, there would be elevated spider abundance in the S plus plots compared to those native and S minus plots. So plots just with native species are plots where the siliques had been removed. 
And if spiders were having the impact I expected on the insect community, I expected aerial insect abundance to be depressed. So I measured this using sticky traps, which were placed just above the level of the, um, the siliques so that the siliques wouldn't directly interfere with the traps. And I expected to see fewer <coughs> insects showing up on the traps in those S plus plots where the siliques were intact compared to the native and the S minus plots. And then I wanted to get an estimate of how this was impacting the native plant community. So I used what I'll refer to as phytometers. And these are basically just plants that I grew up in the greenhouse for a few weeks so that they were all the same age, same size, started out under the same conditions. And I transplanted them out into the field plots and let them grow for the duration of the experiment to see how they responded. And last, oh, well, what I expected here was to see a potentially elevated growth of these phytometers under that S plus plot either due to potentially altered nutrient dynamics or due to protection from herbivory if there were fewer insect herbivores attacking these plants. And last but not least, I measured soil nutrient availability using ion exchange membranes. And I, went, I wasn't actually sure which way this would go. I imagined that you could have high soil nutrient availability due to that carcass deposition effect, or you might potentially see reduced soil nutrient availability if, for example, the native plants were able to draw down nutrients further with their herbivores being somewhat out of the picture. So jumping right into the results, I saw exactly the effect that I expected with spiders here. So to orient you to this picture, on the x-axis we have garlic mustard density, and on the y we have spider density. And this green curve is the, plot, the S plus plots, the plots where the siliques were left intact. And the purple curve is the S minus, where garlic mustard invaded, but the siliques were removed. And as you can see, the, there was a positive relationship between spider density and garlic mustard density in the S plus plots, but not in the S minus. And we can view this another way if we bend these by treatment. And you can see that there are significantly more spiders in the S plus plots compared to both the native and the S minus, about a 14-fold difference here. There was a slight difference still between these two treatments, which I believe was due to my buffer zones not really being quite big enough. I was getting inputs from the surrounding area in those S minus plots. So next, I expected that maybe the insect community would respond to that really elevated spider density. And it, it in fact did. So I took um, these insect abundance estimates at two different time points, both in August and September. And as you can see, there's a significant reduction in the abundance of insects found on the traps between the native and the S plus plots, but not between the native and the S minus. And this is true of both time points. So essentially, we see garlic mustard drawing down native insect abundance when siliques are present, but not doing so when siliques are absent. So I was interested in how this influence the native community. And as I mentioned, I used phytometer species that were grown out in the greenhouse. So I selected three species that commonly co-occur with garlic mustard and that also tend to not be consumed by deer because I kind of uh, wanted to be focused here on insect herbivores and not on the way deer played into this. And I, I didn't want my plants to disappear as soon as I put them out into the field, basically. So, um, so I used Blephelia hirsuta, a uh, hairy wood mint, a Geratina altissima, which is white snake root, also known as the weed that killed Abraham Lincoln's mother, and Elemis hystrix, or bottle brush grass. And I grew these up in the greenhouse for a few weeks, transplanted them out into those field plots, and I found in the case of Blephelia that it responded pretty much as I expected. So there was a significantly higher Blephelia biomass in the S plus plots compared to the S minus plots. So in plots invaded by garlic mustard, the presence of siliques seemed to have some type of protective or beneficial effect on Blephelia, um, with the native, native plots falling somewhere in the middle. In the case of a Geratina, there was actually no effective food web structure here. There was a general increase in growth in the invaded compared to the native plots. Um, and in the case of Elemis, there was no response. So there was an interesting response here in Blephelia. I think part of the reasons for the difference, differences amongst these species is that they are susceptible to different types of insect herbivores, so they may not necessarily respond to a food web restructuring in the same way. They may also have different uh, habitat limitations that are influencing them. But I was interested in why Blophilia responded so strongly. And as I mentioned, this could be a protective effect. If its herbivores are out of the picture, maybe it's growing more. Or this could be a nutrient-based effect. So turning to the nutrient measurements, I found that phosphorus availability did, in fact, respond to treatments. Where there was, um, you'll actually notice that these results mirror the Blophilia biomass results pretty well for that one native phytometer that responded. So there was elevated phosphorus availability in the S plus compared to the S minus plots. 
um, with natives falling somewhere in between. And you'll probably notice that the natives here are highly variable, which makes sense when you think about the fact that my garlic mustard plots were all heavily invaded. They all looked pretty much the same. They had a lot of garlic mustard in them, whereas the native plots could look really different from each other. Some were dominated by a bunch of maple seedlings. Others had a diverse community of forest herbs. So they were more variable, but you'll notice that there was a, an effect of Salix in the invaded plots here. In the case of nitrogen, there was um, no response to food web structure. There was just a marginally significant boost in nitrogen availability in invaded areas, which is consistent with previous work that has shown that garlic mustard can speed up nitrogen cycling. And so I was interested in thinking about how these potential changes to the soil nutrient availability as well as possibly associated changes in soil community structure influence the growth of these plants and whether this could be part of what was driving that response in Blithelia hirsuta. So what I did is I went into each of my plots and I collected soil from, from each replicate plot. So I had soil collected from the native dominated plots, the S minus where the Salix were removed, and the S plus. And I used that soil to inoculate plants that were growing in the greenhouse. So I took um, the three phytometers that I had used in the field as well as garlic mustard seedlings and grew them up in this soil. And what I found is that the, the soil did actually, soil treatment did have a significant effect on the growth of Blophelia. So um, their Blophelia growth was higher in the S plus plots compared to both the native and the S minus plots. So it seemed that there was some kind of soil mediated effect potentially driving that positive response of Blophelia to the presence of these salix. In the case of Ageratina, um, Elemis and garlic mustard, there was no response. So just to revisit the, the predictions here, the experiment confirmed what I expected for spider abundance. It was elevated in those S plus plots, and likewise, the aerial insect abundance was depressed. Um, in the case of phytometers, there was that positive response to S plus in Blophelia, not in the other species, and soil nutrients responded with an increase in phosphorus availability where salix were present. So, I think this really uh, casts light on, on an argument that I tried to make at the beginning, which is that it's important to place our study of invasion into this broader food web context. So if I thought about garlic mustard in this kind of two trophic level system, I would really expect it to be a fairly dominant invader, right? It, it's initiating a positive feedback loop here that should drive it to dominance. But when I expand that food web perspective a little bit, I, I get the opposite result, right? I get garlic mustard initiating an interaction that ultimately has an indirect negative effect on it by benefiting its competitors. And this could result in garlic mustard actually inhibiting itself in the long run. So I've talked a lot about broadening this food web perspective, but as you've all probably noticed, spiders are not the whole story as evidenced by this wood frog that was interfering with my collection of ion exchange membranes, there are a lot of other organisms in the forest. So we have all sorts of reptiles and amphibians that are consuming soil arthropods that are also tied into raptors, owls and hawks, and in, in the food web we have squirrels that are consuming the seed of native competitors, we have deer, we have all these other factors in the system. So I wanted to think about broadening this this view of complexity a little bit to think more about food webs on this scale, where we have a lot of species and a lot of interactions. And I decided that the best way to do that was to use a, a literature synthesis approach. Um, so I wanted to understand this relationship between food web complexity and invasion, and I needed a way to distill food web complexity down into something that I could pull from the literature and that was easy to measure. So I used connectance. And when I talk about food web connectance, I'm talking about the proportion of potential links within a food web that are actually realized. So to, to distill this down to the simplest food web possible, if we had a food web with two species, one of those species consume the other, just a basic consumer resource interaction, we'd have a low connectance value. There's only one arrow here, connectance is only 0.25. Whereas if we had a relationship where these two species each ate one another, perhaps at different life stages, and one species cannibalized itself, then connectance would be much higher, in this case, 0.75. So, I asked myself the question, if you had two different food webs and they had the same number of species at the same trophic level, so you know, initially on the surface the structure looked fairly similar, um, which, but there was one with low connectance, very few links between the species, and one with high connectance, which of these two food webs should be more difficult to invade? 
So which one would offer more resistance to an invader introduced into the system? And I'd actually like you guys to take a vote if you don't mind. So how many people think that food web A, the lower connectance food web, would be more difficult to invade? Raise your hand. Yeah, you can have a second to think about it. <laughs> Didn't help. <laughs> well, does anyone feel strongly about Food Web B? Does anyone think Food Web B would be more difficult to invade? More hands are going up here. Um, what I'll say is that I think there, there's a rationale either way. So I tend to agree with those of you who expect food web B to be more difficult to invade. If you imagine another orange species here, this intermediate consumer, coming into the system, it's going to have to go for one of these basal resources, and it's going to face at least two or three competitors for any of those. Uh, it's also dealing with a, a fairly generalist predator up here that, that may actually consume it. So you would expect it to have both competitors and predators that might reduce its success. On the other hand, this might be a food web constructed with really well-defended specialist species that it can't necessarily subsist on. So there are theory and arguments that I think can work either way, and I wanted to see how this actually played out in the literature. So I did um, just kind of a, a rough analysis, pulling data from disparate sources and seeing what kind of global patterns exist. I, I say that because I want to emphasize that there are some possible alternate explanations, and this is a first pass at this analysis. So I think you know, it's worth considering that this should motivate future research, but, um, but it may not be definitive. So what I did is I went into Web of Science, and I found 23 food webs uh, that were fairly well characterized, where I could get values, um, estimates of directed connectance. And I looked at the food web, and I determined what the habitat type was. Was it a grassland? Was it a lake? And where it was located? Was it in Great Britain, or was it in South Africa? And I went and searched the, the Global Invasive Species Database. And at that point, the, the database was actually structured differently than it currently is. So I was able to search for those specific habitat by region combinations. So I could ask the Global Invasive Species Database how many invasive species have been reported in grasslands in England, and pair that with a food web that had been characterized in a UK grassland. So I looked at the correlation between these two, these two measures, and I found that there actually was a significant correlation here. So on the X, I have the connectance value for the food web of interest, and on the Y, I have the number of invaders observed in the nearest matching food web, and there's a significant negative correlation where there are fewer invaders in those high connectance food webs than in the ones with lower connectance values. And this is true across trophic levels. It's also true if we break this down by trophic level with a particularly strong relationship you'll notice in the case of herbivores. So this is a really striking pattern, but as you all might be thinking, there are some other possible explanations. It may not be about biotic resistance, right? It may be that invaders actually degrade food web connectance. So where we see a lot of invaders, we see lower connectance. Or it could be correlative here where there's a, another extrinsic factor. Maybe really highly disturbed systems have their connectance degraded and also have a lot of invader introductions. But it's, it's a first hint that maybe there is something going on here. So to, to strengthen this a little bit, I wanted to look at it from a different angle. So I went back to those 23 food webs, and I estimated the average connectance by habitat type. So I went, to, I went into it and I analyzed to see, you know, are there actually differences here? Do we see grasslands tending to have a fundamentally different connectance than lakes, for example? And the answer was yes. Um, so you can see them here ranked in order. We have a gradient of connectance across habitat type. So given that, I could do kind of a habitat scale analysis here. And so I went back into the literature again, and I searched for papers that allowed me to estimate biotic resistance against invasion directly. So when I talk about biotic resistance against invasion, I mean how good is the native community at preventing these invaders from coming in and successfully growing their populations. So if you have a lot of natives that are competing with the invader or consuming the invader, you might have strong biotic resistance. So I estimated biotic resistance using experiments that had invaders under two treatments, one where they were just exposed to the native community, um, so they were susceptible to all of those biotic interactions. And another that where they were protected, either through caging, through insecticide application, or through removing neighbors that would be competing with them. And I took the log response ratio of these treatments to get an estimate of biotic resistance. So given an estimate of biotic resistance from a lot of different papers and a lot of different habitat types, I was able to calculate average biotic resistance by habitat type and look at the correlation between connectance and biotic resistance within these habitats. 
And I did this both for consumptive biotic resistance, where you have predators and herbivores consuming invaders, and also for competitive, where you have native species competing against invaders. And what I found um, was, I'll orient you to this for a second, I have the mean connectance for the habitat on the X and the mean consumptive biotic resistance on the Y. And each of these points is one of those habitat types. They correlate to those colors that you saw earlier on. So for example, we have grasslands here in green, lakes in blue, marine systems in purple, et cetera. And as you can see, there is actually a relationship here between connectance in a habitat, average connectance, and mean consumptive biotic resistance. So this is consistent with that idea that more highly connected habitats are more resistant to invasion. This was true for consumptive biotic resistance. This actually wasn't true for competitive biotic resistance. And I think that makes sense when you consider that um, a lot of these competition studies were with plants or barnacles, for example, uh, sessile organisms that were competing more for space or for nutrients, um, which is not so much going to be tied to food web connectance as, for example, you know, uh, predator-prey type interactions. So going back to that initial question of which of these food webs should be more difficult to invade, most of you thought B, and the literature is consistent with that idea at this point. So we see correlations both between connectants and the number of invaders reported, and between connectants and consumptive biotic resistance. So once again, I think this just helps us to emphasize that sort of bringing this food web complexity into our study of invasive species can help us to explain a lot, for example, about global invasion patterns. This has been one of the big questions in invasion ecology since the field was founded. You know, why do some habitats get invaded by a lot of species and others seem fairly resistant to invasion? And this gives us one possible tool to explain that. So summing up, I think this three-pronged approach um, was, was a beneficial way to look at this big question of invaders and food webs, and I'd like to go ahead and continue with this in the future. So I'll just briefly touch upon uh, my plans here at Nimbus. Um, I'll be continuing some of this theoretical work, looking at some spatially explicit models of that garlic mustard system that I talked about in order to uh, understand the long-term implications of this. Is this ultimately going to be a long, uh, a, negative feedback that inhibits garlic mustard invasion, or does that nutrient effect play out in a way that actually drives garlic mustard invasion long term? Um, I also have some, some data from recent experiments that can be used to parameterize those models, and I'm working on some statistical, um, statistical work to come up with a way to better analyze my favorite type of experiment, which is a net, plant, net pairwise plant soil feedback experiment. And in the synthesis realm, I'm continuing to expand this view of food web complexity and invasibility, thinking not just about connectance, which is really just an estimate of the number of links in a system, but thinking about the nature of those links. So we might have some really strong links in a food web, we might have some weak links, and I'm interested in how the, the strength of that interaction and the distribution of that interaction plays out. So with that, um, I left myself a couple of extra slides that I'm going to skip really quickly because I'm running out of time. Um, so I, oh, sorry about that. Um, so I'll just go ahead and, and thank my, my collaborators and all of the people who helped me in the field. All of this work was funded by Yale Institute for Biospheric Studies and or the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And I'd really like to thank Nimbus again for, for the opportunity to be here. And I'm looking forward to working with everyone. So thank you. Um, yeah, so going to your experimental study, I was yeah. wondering if you can comment on how pollinators might kind of play a role in your story, because I noticed yeah. you, you talked about aerial insect abundance, so did you actually check to see if these are all like herbivorous insects versus ones yes. that might pollinate? Yeah, so it's a diverse group, right, and um, there wasn't a really strong differentiation in terms of, you know, herbivores were responding one way and pollinators responding a different way. There was just a general, th these webs are somewhat indiscriminate. They're trapping, you know, whatever flies past. So there could be an impact on pollinators. The one thing that I would argue is that for garlic mustard and for the majority of the species that I was seeing at this time, they weren't necessarily flowering when these spiders were at their peak. A lot of species, you know, flowered later or, or flowered earlier. So it might affect some species more than others. I think there would be some context dependence there. Yeah, because yeah, I was also wondering if you think you'd find something different if you did measure during the flowering seasons. Well, y I think you would, but at the same time, it's 
you're not going to see that interaction, right? So I could go put, and I actually did this, I could go put fake Salik's out, or I actually took old Salik's and taped them to skewers and put them out, and then you can sort of isolate, you know, the effect of these spiders from that garlic mustard biology, but it's not necessarily what's going to be actually happening in the field. Cool, thanks. So uh, about the connectance problem, yeah. so uh, I feel like shouldn't uh, the food web after uh, you fix where the, so shouldn't the new food web be more important for deciding if the invader will be successful or not? Like if you have a new invader and how much the connectance changes after the invader comes in and yeah. the Connect connectedness of the invader matters more, doesn't it? Uh, have you looked at that? Is yes. So I, I haven't looked at that with the current data set. I didn't um, have the ability to do that with what I had, but that's one of one of the things I'd really like to look into. So one thing that's fairly easy to estimate is what is the average interact interaction strength um, of an invader in the food web where it came, where it originated in its native range, and is the strength of that that sort of average interaction predictive of its impact on the, the native food web that it's now invading. So I think that's a really interesting question to look into. And there have been some, at least, models that have shown that invaders could certainly be altering connectants, altering food web structure. And we see that in the cases of, you know, really powerful predators that are introduced and they wipe out a lot of species and remove all of those links. So, yeah, that's definitely kind of the other side of the coin there. I have the mic. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot for, uh, for that great talk, and welcome to Nimbus. Glad Thank to have you, you here. Um, so I have uh, two questions. Uh, one uh, deals with the input of insect parts <laughs> <laughs> and whatever uh, is uh, falling out of the, yeah. uh, the webs. So these are biennials, right? <laughs> so, uh, and, and it's only flowering one year, and so if the web production is high only in that year, right then there, this creates a natural two-point cycle yeah. kind of system. Yeah. Um, so is, it, uh, is the roseate that forms the next year dependent upon nitrogen, or I assume it's nitrogen, uh, and, and have there been studies in different kinds of uh, soils? Have you done that with different nitrogen yeah. levels? and? Yeah, so actually the, the six sites that I had in southern Connecticut were across a fairly broad gradient of, of sort of different underlying geology and mm -hmm. nutrient availab availability as a baseline was different, but the response was not necessarily different. So there was actually no response in nitrogen, but a boost in phosphorus at all sites when, when the spiders were present. Oh, um, but, but yes, so I think the, the sage structure here, you know, when you have one field season, it it's difficult to get at that, especially because garlic mustard tends to synchronize populations. You tend to have a year where it's mostly salix at one site, and then the next year is mostly rosettes. Does that nutrient effect linger long enough to influence the growth of next year's rosettes? I'm not sure. I would argue from my greenhouse study, probably not. It seemed like garlic mustard didn't respond in terms of the soil treatments, whereas at least the one native species did. And... Um, as kind of a teaser, I had a follow-up greenhouse experiment that kind of backed that up. It looked like garlic mustard was actually participating in a neutral plant soil feedback when spiders were absent, but a negative feedback when they were present, indicating that you know the, the underlying dynamics were promoting diversity as, as opposed to invader dominance um, long term. So, so, so that was that due to some soil components? Some it seems, yeah, yeah. It's, so it could be the soil microbial community. Yeah. It could be this nutrient-mediated effect. And future work will, you know, in the future when I am back in the greenhouse, I'll have to look into that. Okay. Yeah. And, and then the other question dealt with the question of invasibility of food webs. Mm -hmm. and, and perhaps I've missed this in the literature, but it, uh, this depends upon the distribution of in invaders of different at different trophic levels right um, so is there a general way to assess invasibility of a food web as a function of the vector of percentage uh, that probability of invasion by by different uh, uh, by individual species at different trophic levels so so let me ask if I'm interpreting this correctly are you saying can we go and assess 
how successful invaders are in a habitat based on trophic level and then use that information to predict future invasions? Or no. did I misinterpret? No, sorry. So um, if, if you look at the distribution of potential invaders right. across the okay. area, so there's that, uh, there are different trophic levels. So right. imagine randomly pulling out of a pot sure. uh, a, a potential invader. And so the probability it, of it being at one trophic level is different than at another. Mm -hmm. And so the probability of successful invasion depends upon what that distribution is. Right. So the distribution in the species pool that's potentially invading. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I don't know that I could derive from the literature that I have data on the species pool. Like there is, unfortunately, in invasion ecology, it's hard to know what is potentially being introduced and not being successful. So I could tell you which invaders are the most successful, but I don't know what failed. Yeah. Um, so that's a good question. And well, that's, I, that's yeah. why Dan is not here, but yeah. <laughs> if anyone would know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you.